Welcome back to Missing. I am Tim here today with Lance. Lance, how are you today? I'm doing so well today, Tim. This episode, this conversation that is coming up features a story that while on the surface feels like it's going to be this hard-boiled true crime story about a prison break, but turns into the story about two individuals who never met each other getting to know, weirdly enough, getting to know each other and discovering things about certain aspects of themselves that they didn't know existed. I find it incredibly fascinating and can't wait to hear what the listeners think about it, Tim, but I personally can't wait to hear how you are today. (laughs) I am doing great. Thanks a lot for asking. I am very excited to introduce this conversation that we had with Chief Jeff Britton, and he tells us all about the story of William Leslie Arnold, who killed his parents when he was 16 years old in 1958 and was sent to prison, escaped prison in 1967, and then, well, I guess you're going to have to listen to, uh, to hear some more of the specifics, but he traveled the world, didn't he, Lance? He sure did, and Chief Britton followed him for a number of years, becoming a bit obsessed with this escapee, and again, learning a lot about this person, and it became a story about not only the prison break, but Jeff's journey as well. Well, I think this conversation is kind of timely, Lance, because we recently spoke with Laura Risty about William Bradford Bishop, who killed his family and went on the run. And during that conversation, we also spoke about John List, who did the same thing. And you kind of hear about how some of these fugitives sort of evade capture. And this story is really much more unique, I would say, um, because of what he did with his life. And what he did with his life sort of proves to you that the crime that he committed had a lot more to it than just maybe a spoiled kid getting upset at his parents for not being able to borrow the car. There was something deeper going on there that was not put out there to the public because, again, like you said, what he did with his life after he escaped prison is completely contrary to what you would expect someone in that position to be like. And it's really interesting to look at the pictures of William Leslie Arnold through the years um, when he was a kid first uh, in the 50s and then as an older adult in Australia. So make sure to check out our social media pages for pictures of him. You can find that at Missing CSM. And Tim, if people wanted to hear this episode, plus all of the other episodes that we've produced without commercials, where would they go? Well, our lovely listeners can subscribe to Missing Premium now on Apple Podcasts. It's $4.99 a month. You get ad-free episodes, early releases, and our weekly bonus show. And if you're not an Apple user, you can go to missing.supportingcast.fm and sign up for the same product there. And we're going to take a quick break right now for a commercial, and we will be back with Chief Jeff Britton and his story about the escaped inmate William Leslie Arnold. Welcome to the podcast, Jeff Britton. Jeff, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you very much. Thanks for joining us and taking the time to speak about this really cool story that you have regarding an escapee. No, I appreciate that. It's a long road. Yeah, th- this is amazing. Um, but you are also the chief. You're, you're Chief Britton. And uh, for those who don't know you, can you fill in the listeners as to your background and who you are? Of course. Um, so my name is Jeff Britton. Uh, my current position is uh, I'm the chief of the Office of Law Enforcement Support in Sacramento, California, uh, for the state of California. And I oversee investigations of institutions within the state Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, but for that, I was an investigator for the state of Nebraska Department of Personal Services. And has law always been in the family? Is this something that you, has been passed down through generations? No, um, I do have family members uh, that were in law enforcement. They they retired. Uh, from from their careers. Uh, so it's been part of our family in different forms, but it was it was my interest and I pursued it. Very cool. And while in Nebraska, you were looking into a cold case, is that right? Yes. So in 2004, I started with the department a few years before that, but in 2004, I asked if I could look at some of the cold cases. And 
and I never thought I'd find one so much before my my time, literally before my lifetime. Um, so there's a fugitive in question that escaped in 1967 from the Nebraska State Penitentiary. And you said that you uh, wanted to find out more about escapees. What was it that started the process? Were you always interested in this because of your position or was there something that kind of sparked something? Well, in in 2003, about that same time, uh, 2004, uh, there was escape from a facility uh, in the state of Nebraska, and that person was uh, quickly apprehended. But it made me think of what it took to escape from a prison and what the impact would be if you're on the run for a long period of time. So that got my interest in escapes, just in general. And then to realize that the, the department I even worked for had one of such length that was unresolved. Is this one that we're about to talk about, was that the only one that was unresolved? Um, no, there were some others uh, that were walkaways from work, or work release program or parole of scotters, but nothing of this magnitude, uh, especially from a secured institution such as the Nebraska State Penitentiary. And how did you find this case? Um, I, I asked for a roster of any escape cases, and uh, number one was... Uh, this escape in itself just because the age of it. I'd like to imagine the reaction of the person you asked for a roster of escapees. Is this something that is common for someone in your position to look into? Well, as an investigator for the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services, um, we were assigned many different topics. It could be drug trafficking. It could be employee misconduct. It could be all sorts of things. Since we were assigned a, a variety of investigations, I don't think it was a, an odd request uh, per se, but it was definitely one that they had to go in to get some records and basically dust them off because it was just so old. Okay. And you said something before that sparked a little bit of my, piqued a little bit of my interest. You said that there are some parole absconders, which I know what that is. I, but then you said there is these walkaways. Sure. And th- is that literally like they walked away from like a, a furlough or something? Exactly right. And, and uh, you're spot on. So when, when inmates get classified by security levels and programming processes, they can uh, get to work release. And work release is at a center. It's one of the facilities within the Department of Corrections uh, that, you, that you can be housed there at night and you can go to a job during the day or depending on your programming. And so you're, you're free to go to your job during the day in the community. So you're in the community. But you have to be back by a certain time. There's certain rules and regulations that surround it. But if you don't come back, you, in essence, quote unquote, walked away. And then you would get a, a warrant to get picked up, and then they would be brought back to the Department of Corrections for processing. So it's not as it's, in that case, it's not as an over the fence type of escape. This person could have been out at a job and just decided I'm not going back. And that's something you had worked on. Uh, there was a handful over the years. Uh, it just it's it's been a while since I worked on uh, walkaway cases or absconders for that matter. I can't think of prison escapes without thinking of Shawshank Redemption. <laughs> yeah, that's a. You, you can think of Shawshank, Escape from Alcatraz, just the, the classic prison escape movies. Uh, but there's just other versions of, like, Escape, a walk away, and Absconders, but they all exist. Is uh, Nebraska pretty high security? You said with well, the level of security for Nebraska. Is it is that one of, like, the top in the country? Um, it, there's maximum security facilities within Nebraska, of course, Nebraska State Penitentiary uh, being being one of them. So it's it's just different security protocols, of course. And the case that we're going to talk about today, this is involving a murderer um, who escaped prison. Can you tell us a little bit about this case? This inmate uh, was sentenced to state penitentiary uh, in, in Lincoln, Nebraska, uh, for the murdering his parents in 1958. And he was uh, William Leslie Arnold at that time. Correct. So William Leslie Arnold in 1958 murdered his parents. Uh, surrounding a conversation over the use of the family vehicle to go on a date. Um, obviously, I think there's there's much more to that interaction, but nonetheless, that's the conversation that took place at the time of the uh, incident. And as a result, he was ultimately convicted and sent to Nebraska State Penitentiary uh, to serve out his sentence. Um, so there was a period of time that he he murdered his parents. He did bury them in the backyard. And then he carried on and, and he told people that his parents went to see, look for a grandparent, take care of another family member. And his little brother was taken care of by someone else. And that went on for about 10, 11 days, as I recall, uh, from my readings. And then ultimately he was confronted about the location of his parents. And that's when he ultimately confessed and took authorities uh, to where he buried them in the backyard, and that those photos have been listed in the newspaper or shown in the newspapers and other spots. Right. And the whole 
tipping point for Arnold was the fact that he wasn't able to borrow his parents' car to go on a date. And you had a really interesting statement there where you're like, there's more to it. I mean, has to be. You would think there would have to be. Um, I don't know what his uh, life at home was like. There's been conversations surrounding the fact that maybe he was abused or not treated well by the family. Um, but nothing, obviously, I can show or prove. Um, but when you come down to it, if, if you get asked to use the family car to go on a date, obviously, uh, murder is not the response for uh, a denial of that request. So I just always felt that there has to be more to that. Um, or maybe it was a tipping point of other things going on between him and his parents or him and his mother, uh, that that was uh, the icing on the cake for for other issues. I don't know. I don't think any of us will truly know that answer. And nothing like that was used in his defense, like self-defense or, or abuse or anything like that? No, not from what I've read about the case. Um, he pretty much, uh, he immediately took responsibility. Well, immediately once confronted, of course. And then uh, he shared with what he'd done and where he put them and shared his version. And then he ended up going off to prison. How did he get caught? Um, so it looks like the story kind of, uh, looks like it fell apart over time uh, where the parents were. Um, he tried to carry on as much as his normal life as possible, but ultimately people not realizing where the parents were. It's my understanding that the police and the grandparents, that the fam the story he told to go look for the grandparents or grandfather, uh, they ended up coming to town. And then with the police, they confronted him. And not to get salacious into, you know, graphic details, but what was the nature of the murders? Was it something that looked like a, a frenzied killing or was it more kind of calculated? You know, I never saw actual uh, crime scene photos. I saw crime scene photos of the location, but I've never seen crime scene photos of, of his parents or bodies of any kind. Um, but it, uh, he did commit the crime by use of a rifle, uh, shooting both parents. And ultimately, uh, in the days to follow, burying, burying them in the yard. Okay, yeah. I mean, I'm not condoning this crime in any means, but we recently spoke about somebody who killed their entire family with a hammer who had the option to kill them with a gun because he had a weapon in the house, but he chose to buy a hammer, go to go to a hardware store, and then come back and killed them with the hammer. And right. and there's like, what was it, four members of his family, which is insane. You know, it's just like, there. It's, so when you say a rifle, I'm thinking, all right, like I could see a kid 16 years old, maybe he was abused, maybe there was some something else going on, snaps, like this whole temporary insanity type Right. I, and I don't disagree that something else was going on. And I think he, he probably presented the firearm to to maybe give the impression to his mother that, you know, he he is a, a young man. He's not a kid and uh, shows this weapon. And then in that in that interaction ends up shooting her uh, again, not condoning it, of course. Uh, and just, we just don't know what that true interaction was that led to uh, the, her being shot initially. Um, there is quotes of him, her of having said to him, at least in old court documents, as I recall, she goes, what are you going to do, shoot me? Uh, right beforehand. Wow, that's pretty eerie. Um, how long did he spend in prison? Um, approximately eight years. So he went in in 19... went to jail immediately, but ultimately uh, 1959, he escaped in 1967, maybe eight to nine years. He escaped with uh, another inmate in, in, in July 14, 1967. And what was the escape like? So from what we've pieced together, it looks like a, a former parolee that had paroled earlier in the year uh, participated in it and arranged for items to be thrown over the fence, possibly masks to, to assist with the uh, inmate count periods to make sure everyone gets accounted for, and then also communicated through the use of classified ads in the local paper, because obviously the, none of the technologies that we enjoy today existed then. And, and classified ad, ads were used uh, to describe the, the, the date of and they were, uh, in the ad. And it said NOF uh, ended up being uh, related to Night of Freedom, July 14th, 1967. And that's ultimately the date uh, they went over the fence. Well, that's something I never heard before. Jeez, was that something that's common? Using So a prisoner used a classified ad to try to find someone on the outside? Well, not necessarily that. So it's it's a it's a parolee from the state, same prison that released in the months prior to the escape, they, they may have had conversations uh, planning in, in advance, and that's how they would communicate uh, in the meantime is through the use of classified ads. And when I went through some of the classified ads, you would find ads commonly at that time of 
you know, uh, driving from Omaha to Denver, anybody interested in sharing uh, fuel expenses. And so it was, it was almost like the electronic media that we see today or how do we sell things and whatnot. But that's how they communicated a lot. Many, many offers to share expenses to travel were in the classified ads, among other things, of course. And uh, that's how they communicated for July 14th. How did that communication work when placing a classified ad? Did the prisoner could call the paper? Possibly call the paper, go to the newspaper, say, I want to put a classified ad. And it's some nondescript advertisement. They pay probably a what we would call a very low cost fee and have that ad placed in the newspaper. And then obviously the facilities uh, receive newspapers and they could inmates could look at the classified ads for their message. That's wild. We actually had a uh, conversation, a pre-interview conversation before, and this didn't come up. And I'm like fascinated by this. I think Tim is pretty fascinated by this, that this communication happened like kind of under the noses of all the guards. It's incognito like communication. It was hidden right in front of everybody. Wow. I think that that, that classified ad has been uh, published in the newspaper since. Okay. So what happened when he got free? Uh, I understand he was with somebody else. What was their journey like? So what we pieced together at that time and over the years is that uh, once they made their escape, um, they made it to, from Lincoln to Nebraska, uh, to Omaha, Nebraska which is a probably 50 or 60 miles apart. And uh, Leslie, as he was most commonly referred to, uh, called his friend, uh, a neighborhood friend, a, a little bit older, and said, hey, uh, and, and from what was reported to me is that he said that we escaped and I need a ride. Uh, he made a phone call from a, a pay phone uh, to his friend's house. And uh, his friend was on a date that night, but did agree to uh, come pick him up. And I've spoken to that person uh, at the time, and they've confirmed that that was what happened. And also, I've interviewed the person he was on a date with, uh, the friend that helped. And what he he shared with me is that they picked him up, uh, took him back to the house, made tuna fish sandwiches, and gave him some money. And he said he had approximately $40 that he could give him um, because he was home himself uh, from college. Uh, But what was going on this day when I got the call, uh, the, uh, the girlfriend of the other person said that she was not what this was not what she was expecting to do that night uh on their date um but did did remember these two these two guys now known as the inmates getting in the car and that they after the house uh getting some food this the tuna fish sandwiches and that always stood out to me that he specifically remembered tuna fish sandwiches uh they drove to a train station in in Iowa uh, but mind you keeping on the Omaha Nebraska and Council Bluffs Iowa are just minutes apart they they border each other and there was no trains coming anytime soon. So they ended up going back to uh, the train station in downtown Omaha and then ultimately getting on a bus to Chicago. And that's where uh, the story parted ways for a long period of time. Of what we knew, of we could show, but we didn't believe they, they went to uh, Chicago. In fact, I will point out that at one point, uh, many, many years ago, I was contacted by authorities in Chicago that maybe he became a victim of John Wayne Gacy. Uh, the serial killer that was uh, killing people and often that came in to the bus station in Chicago and that maybe he fit that profile. Um, ultimately, obviously, that's not what happened, uh, but that was an interesting phone call to receive that maybe he was one of these uh, victims that they later discovered. Wow. Yeah. So what happens to your perspective on the investigation when you hear something like that? Well, taking on a case like this, and obviously it wasn't my full-time case. It's something I did in conjunction with my other uh, duties. Um, but there was a lot of people you know, and friends and law enforcement and others that I would talk to about the case. And, you know, many thought that Leslie would, had likely died. And then there was some thought, well, maybe he made it. Um, there was just a mix of feelings of what uh, happened. So keep in mind that uh, Leslie escaped five years before I was born. So obviously he's got a, a huge head start. And so to what his life may have became, I had no idea at the time. And so we just kept doing interviews of anyone I could, uh, wherever they were, or whenever possible, that may have known him, seen him, talked to him. And that includes the the girlfriend from the night of making the request for the movies, to, to use the car to go to the drive-in. Ironically, the, the drive-in movie uh, was The Undead. That's, that was the movie being shown that night. It was The Undead with a double feature of uh, No Time for Sergeants. 
Um, so I can't imagine what he was thinking at a drive-in movie, watching that movie, knowing what he had just done hours earlier. Yeah. So this this uh, case had taken a lot of twists and turns, but ultimately it wasn't until uh, a long time later that we, we, we got more answers. Were there leads in the meantime that um, pointed you in, in different directions? Sure. So, so ultimately, I was able to locate the parolee that helped in the escape. And he was interviewed uh, by a detective in California uh, when I was in Nebraska. And uh, the detective uh, contacted him. Um, his memory wasn't the best. Um, obviously, he's a much older man at that point. And ultimately, uh, he said that he did uh, help him. He referred to him as the, the two boys. So I'm assuming he was an older uh, inmate at the time that had paroled, but he remembered helping the two boys escape, uh, mentioned the, the classified ad, and that uh, there was some discussion, but there were some memory issues that he had heard that they were in Chicago, but then he may have met up with them and, and they went into Canada. And one, uh, oh, the other inmate ultimately was captured in Los Angeles. Um, but it was interesting for him to finally recall that uh, he did help. He did help with the getting them the items to help escape and whatnot and the classified ad. So it was an interesting perspective so many decades later uh, to, to hear his rough recollection, but a uh, recollection nonetheless. So other people that we've interviewed, you know, there, there, there was talk that there were sightings. There was some similar names. Um, in fact, one person had a very similar name with the exact same date of birth. Um, so, and, uh, for just quick appearances, looking at that person's driver's license, it was enough uh, for us to go talk to him uh, four states away. I'm like, what are the odds that he would keep a very similar name in the exact same date of birth and be living uh, four states to the east? Um, but we did go talk to him, and he actually uh, he understood while we were there. Um, it's not his favorite topic. It turns out he had been contacted by the FBI uh, decades before that, um, but we didn't have a record of that at the time. But it was definitely a similar appearance and identical date of birth and a similar name. It was it was one of the ones like this can't be, but you know you got to go check because you have to check everything you can because you don't know what's going to turn a case and definitely you don't you don't know what's going to turn a case as we've learned. You said that it wasn't his favorite topic to discuss. He wasn't was he like standoffish? He was a little standoffish, but I think he had been contacted before. I didn't. I thought he he had a little bit of overreaction to being contacted. You know, thirty years later. It's not like he was contacted every week, but again, I'm not in that person's shoes, and I wouldn't want to be accused as a, uh, a someone that was doing time for murder, let alone escape from prison. He was ultimately cooperative, of course. Can we show it wasn't him? Did he have to give his DNA or something like that? No, and this that was obviously DNA technology. His the advancements uh, have been tremendous more in the last few years than ever before. Um, but we did fingerprinting at the time, just to just to, to just to be safe and be sure. Right. And um, yeah, tell us about the uh, DNA advancements and um, how that first started to change this case. Well, I, I want to guess it was in 2008 or 2009. I reached out to the brother of Leslie, uh, who, who's a, a man in his uh, 70s himself, the, the younger brother, and uh, ultimately got a DNA sample from him many, many years ago. He was a, a, a nice man, a cooperative uh, person, uh, willing to assist us. Uh, he shared some things with me, uh, obviously about the case, because he was a, he was at his part time job at the time that the the murders happened, and then, then obviously he lost his parents, so he definitely shared uh, his feelings about everything. But he was willing to to help us. Uh, gave us a DNA sample that we did submit and did some run some tests on unidentif unidentified remains, and and other cases to see maybe uh, Leslie had died and we didn't know just no, no one who he was. Um, that did not uh, pan out. Some characteristic items came up at times just on our description and not related to the DNA, but it being in the system that, uh, you know, remains were found, um, but nothing ever, ever, ever hit like that. But the brother was uh, uh, very nice to talk to. I have talked to him since uh, several times, but the DNA technology then, uh, was was excellent, but just the advancements even since that time to the last couple of years that's been used in other cases has just uh, been exponential in a, in cases to help. So I left Nebraska in 2013, and I relocated uh, to California, um, and I continued 
uh, in investigations. I stayed with the case unofficially. I had asked my supervisor, hey, can I look into this from time to time? Just, I didn't know who was going to pick it up. It was an old case. It was definitely cold. In, uh, he, he had no objections. In uh, to said, well, there's no if you find anything, of course. And But I didn't know who was going to pick it up in its entirety and continue with it, if anybody, because it was so old. Uh, especially, as I mentioned, it was the escape was five years before I was born, and now I'm in my 50s. Um, so that's definitely a, a head start. So I worked on it. Uh, from time to time, I would read about it. I would do some research on my own and just to see what, you know, try to put myself in his shoes, what he would have been facing. And one thing I found interesting is everything I've ever seen him in has been black and white. So I, I found myself thinking about what what was available to him back then. And I started thinking about it in black and white. And how would he get identification? How would he get a social security card? Um, the processes were much different in 1967, 68. Um, you would get a, you could get a social security card from what I learned at the post office with very little scrutiny. And so maybe that's one of the, the processes that he ultimately used. And nothing like the technology we have today for verifications and the requirements of documents. And many laws have changed to protect uh, personal data, even within uh, government services. So I, I don't think this, and I'll never say never, but I don't think this could be re replicated in the manner in which he did it then. And staying with it for those years between 2013, uh, just on, uh, just following up on my own, just on my own curiosity to try to get an answer for this, I started tracking the Golden State Killer case uh, in California and discussions around uh, ultimately what we learned is the, the use of tech, DNA technology that had advanced. And uh, in 2020, 2019, 2020, I reached out to the U.S. Marshal and I thought there has to be a mechanism that maybe we could look at DNA again because of the advancements that had occurred in the years since. And I and I had knew I knew the U.S. Marshal from when I, I lived uh, in Nebraska, and so uh, he said that he would put someone in touch with me. And I, I can't remember how long later it was, but I, uh, ultimately, uh, Deputy U.S. Marshal Matt Westover contacted my office. Uh, I've learned since, and, and uh, Matt's a fantastic uh, investigator, and he definitely took an interest to the case because obviously, obviously, there's lots of twists and turns, and it's very interesting. But he shared with me, he looked in the newspaper and he he saw this case that he went into and it had some questions of why he had it on his roster because it's not a traditional case. You know, I think it was listed as a murder in 1958 on his roster. And so and since they deal, the U.S. Marshal deals more with court security and fugitives, couldn't quite understand why he had it. But as he looked into it, he learned that, in fact, this case did surround a, a fugitive, escape from a, a prison, which definitely is a. Uh, in the interest and purview of the U.S. Marshal Service. And so from prior articles, he saw my name and saw that I was still in law enforcement in my current role and reached out to me. And for the next two, two and a half years, we talked regularly, times every week, discussing the case, research I had done, his ideas. And then ultimately, uh, Deputy Westover went and got more DNA from the brother, who was again cooperative. And uh, they put that out and used uh, with, with the cooperation of the brother. Uh, and then ultimately, years later, in August 2022, uh, there was a match. And that brings us to today, or at least several months ago. But publicly, uh, here we are. You said that the younger brother was uh, cooperative with you and the... U.S. Marshals with Westover and with the DNA, but had he been cooperative from the start of everything? Well, I mean, what, like from the murder on, was he always? Well, from the murder on, he would have been a, a twelve or thirteen year old boy. Yeah, he shipped off to live with family after uh, after the the murders. So I I can't speak until my contact with him in the early two thousands, and uh, he was always very kind to me, understood why we were doing it understand why we're still looking. And so then subsequently when Matt Westover made contact with him, he got the same reception in a uh, more DNA. And, but now this time it can go into, to be used by better technology that we didn't have even 10, 15, 20 years ago. So cool. So in fact, I'll, I'll share what I met, uh, you know, he was, he was known to be a musician and he dropped it for a period of time, but he was obviously into music and there's pictures out there of him playing a saxophone. In fact, his, uh, on one of my contacts with his girlfriend from high school, um, she still had one of his instruments from high school. And uh, she said that she would have to look for it, but she ultimately uh, gave it to me. 
and then we tried to test it for DNA. And while we didn't get a match, uh, DNA was present, but nothing at the time period because it was just so long ago. But it was one of those opportunities like, well, maybe we can get DNA off the reed or with an instrument. Uh, but only, that wasn't productive. But she she didn't give it to us. And I uh, ultimately, when after we did our testing, moved. I gave the instrument to Leslie's brother. To the, and I think it needed to go basically back home. Yeah, that makes sense. Okay, so how surprised were you when you heard that there was a match made? Well, when you've worked on something and thought about something for so long, you know, even just in the, in the last several years, just you're thinking about it and see what can be done. It's kind of surreal uh, to learn that after all this time. So I'm, I've, if I'm nearing 15 to 20 years of looking into this case or knowledge of it, and he escaped five years before I was even born, just so much time has passed. And to be told that there's a strong likelihood we found a, a familial relationship, I was floored. It's just, uh, wow, there's an answer. And so then the investigation went on from there. So now we could fill in the blanks of what happened from Chicago as best we could. You know, that he ultimately got married and had a new identity within 130 days, I think, 134 days of his escape, which is phenomenally quick, in my opinion. Uh, but he did it, uh, got a job, uh, met a woman who had kids, single mom, became a stepdad. Then ultimately, I don't know the details of the end of that relationship. But he ended up meeting someone else and then having uh, two kids of his own in, in later years and then traveled around. And it's my understanding he was a traveling salesman of sorts and then uh, ultimately uh, passed away in Australia in uh, 2010. And then the only reason it came up is because uh, his son had questions of, you know, I've always told my 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 dad was an orphan from Chicago, which on Interesting that is that's not a lie. Um, he was an orphan. I mean, by his own doing, um, he orphaned himself, and he did. He was in Chicago, but he had a life before that in Omaha, which included the the killing of his own parents. So I'm, I'm confident that's what the son never expected to find uh, when you're trying to find out more about your your late father. Um, but the family has shared with me, and, I, and I've spoken to his family several times that he was a good father and he was a good provider. And that just wasn't their experience with him, um, but they're slowly coming to terms with what they've learned. And I have no impression that they had any of them, including Leslie's wife, had any knowledge. I just don't get that impression they had any knowledge just based on their reactions and the conversations we've had. Uh, so now they're processing uh, what they did learn. You know, you think you're going to find a long lost relative or find something connected to your, your dad's apparent adoption. And then you find out this. And then you see, I'm, I'm, I'm confident he looked at pictures that, that I shared with him and the U.S. Marshal Service showed him in the newspapers that that's his, that's his dad. So that's, that's got to be a lot of process that I don't think any of us can appreciate uh, finding that discovery. Uh, when you're thinking one thing and you find something tragically different of a person you thought you knew very, very well. But I'm, I'm thankful to have learned that he was reported to be a good father and a good provider. And in many ways, and, I, and I've said this before, that I think he became the, the parent he wanted to be or he didn't have. And uh, that's what he gave his children. And was his son looking into this sort of concurrently while you were looking into it and and then you came together? Well, uh, in a lot of ways, yes. So it was the times that we were looking at it. He passed away in 2010. His uh, son still would have himself been an adult at the time. And he wanted to learn more about his father. There's a very strong likelihood at times that when at least I was looking into it, that uh, his son was looking for him too to learn more, of course, not him, to learn more about his past. And so I think that's always, I think about that from time to time. Of We're both looking for the same person. We have two different ideas of who that person is. And for me, it was a good reminder ultimately now that I've, I've learned so much more about the case through all of this is it changes your perspective. Everyone has a different perspective based on their experiences. And that's never been more true that than this case. It's not his family's experience. So yes, he did a bad thing in his, his teen years. But I think if there was going to be an outcome, I think this is one of those uh, outcomes that's just a blessing, all things considered, of what it could have been. Wow. Um, so do you have any 
knowledge on how he changed his identity uh, when he got out of prison? No, I, I know that the the protocols or procedures to to come up with an identity are on were much more lax and probably easier to do at that time. Um, he did have a birth certificate that was clearly uh, a fake birth certificate, and that's what he became. And he used that to create his identity and anchor himself to that identity for the remainder of his life. Um, so, yeah, I don't uh, know how he did it. I do know that it was on the basis of a, a fake birth certificate, but he was successful. He, and one thing I do know, and, and, and I've said this before, is uh, he was a smart man. He was bright. And you, I don't think very few people could accomplish something like this. And again, I'm not discounting the the murder of his parents in the least, but for someone to carry this level of uh, baggage and personal experience and tragedy, obviously by his own doing, but it's a lot to carry and to keep clear. So he's he's not a. It was reported that he's he's a very smart man. He was a good salesman, but I just I can't imagine the road he was on. Although I'm carrying that in his mind because you don't you don't he cannot you know he has to you and i any of us we get stopped by the police for speeding or whatnot imagine what goes through his head on just a simple police contact throughout his whole life that could be the police arrive to the neighbors to take a report of vandalism he doesn't know looking out the window if they're there for him because he's carrying this this criminal history with him that's been uh, unresolved do you think that was part of the reason why or most of the reason why he ended up in australia Australia creates a great distance from his past. I do know he moved around quite a bit and possibly many times unexplained to his family, but they moved as a family. Um, but, you know, Australia is pretty far away and probably uh, maybe that helped him mentally to be that distance from his past. Because obviously he wasn't living in uh, Nebraska and did move around quite a bit, but he has to carry that and figure out what he's going to do to to remain successfully on the run and ultimately accomplish that. But I think he went far away, both for mental reasons as well as to avoid capture if that was the case. Did you have a thought on where you thought he would have been um, before finding out where he ended up? Did did you have any theories? Well, there was. Uh, I often thought that he probably went out of the country. Initially, I learned that he may have went to Canada for a period of time. But I thought he may have gone to South America. And there was conversations that that's where he would go. The, the source of the validity of those things that we had learned, I, I'm not clear on because some of them predate me, but also South America, Brazil, whatnot. Um, it, did, it wouldn't surprise me if he went out of the country, maybe to a country that doesn't have extradition. I do recall uh, someone did search for my name uh, in Google and with my full name and with the title of investigator and the IP address of that search uh, created an alert at that time. Because I was tracking it, and that IP address came back to South America. So who who did that search, and why is someone searching for me down there? Uh, that, that's a be a remarkable coincidence. Um, but also, I also looked at searches done on the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services website to see if anyone ever looked them up. I know I looked them up on the website, and anybody can do it. It's a it's a publicly accessible. Then I wondered, okay, did anyone search for him? So I could see where I searched for him. Uh, over the years and just to look at information in, in that system at the time you could search for inmates by just the inmate number that they're assigned when they come to prison or by their name and it'll give you a roster of anyone with the, that name or similar name and their corresponding crimes county of commitment etc i was able for to look at the searches someone looked them up just by inmate number so it made me think that if you're going to look them up by inmate number you're probably one of two people you're either him because who else knows his number but him? Every inmate knows their inmate number. Or me, someone looking for him. Or someone in, a, in an official capacity that's looking for him that would know that. Because otherwise, because there was no prior searches of just his name to then tell you the number. Someone searched strictly with his number on their first search. And that IP address at the time came back out of the country to South America. So when I combined those two, it made me think, okay, how is this possible? That I mean, both in my opinion... Most coincidences are well planned. And the fact that someone's searching by inmate number and by my name, all out of the country in, in similar locations. So that's me. Maybe, maybe it was him. Maybe that's where he was traveling at the time. I don't officially know that he was there or not, but I do find those searches uh, interesting. 
And that's really interesting. What year was that? 2009, 2010, but prior prior to his to his death. Oh, well, now we know to be his death. When did he move to Australia? I don't have that date. I don't recall it off the top of my head. I think it was after 9-11 that he remained out of the country. It was told to me that uh, he traveled much, much less after 9-11. So I think he's out of the country at that time. I guess I was wondering if it was like a stopover before going to Australia, but it seems like that'd be too long of a duration. Yeah, I didn't look much further into that uh, in, the, in the later years, but that definitely stood out to me that he very well could have been there. Or maybe he did searches. I went as far as to think maybe he did searches using a virtual private network or a VPN of sorts, because um, I always felt that he was a, a smart person that maybe he thought of that in those years to, to mask that so he could go look something up and try to have some sort of anonymity. Yeah, yeah, probably right. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel like it's a little bit unbelievable to think that he bounced around um, to different countries and moved around uh, in the country so seemingly kind of easily after changing his identity, he had relationships. Um, mm-hmm. I don't know. It seems like like a crazy skill to be able to blend in like that and just restart your life. Well, he obviously had great success at doing it for him. Um, obviously, his, his life depended on it. Um, so he probably made very strategic decisions to avoid detection all those years. I, I think it had to be quite a, a burden, but yeah, his life depended on it. He never reached out, as far as you know, or no suspicion that he reached out to his younger brother in all those years? N- no indication of that, um, even though I, I have asked his brother if they've had contact, and he said no. His brother always seemed very forthright with me and an and a honest and decent person to me to this day. Um, but no other knowledge of him reaching back into his prior life. Uh, is known to me or others for that matter that, I, that I'm aware of. And does it seem to you that he would be doing this or not doing this in order to protect the person that would receive the information? Well, it, I think it's both. He could have been a very, uh, very well been a protective older brother. And if you take the position that maybe he had an adverse relationship with his parents, maybe he was protecting his brother. Maybe he's preserving himself and decided that if I'm going to be successful at this, I can never reach back into my prior life. And that could be a reason. There's all sorts of reasons for not crossing back over. And ultimately, it's it's obvious that he was successful because uh, while he did technically die on the run, he was a fully in, invested in a new life. Uh, so he had success. I know you're law enforcement, but is there a part of you that admires him for eluding capture for so long and through so many generations? Well, that that's an interesting question. And that was posed to me uh, by the... A reporter from the Omaha Herald, uh, Henry Cordes, once, you know, and and I and I was quoted as saying that you know the police officer and me early on wanted to find him, locate him, bring him back uh, on the escape charges, and let him face justice back in Nebraska. As it got into later years, the more I th- thought about it and wonder what his life could have been if he was still alive at all, or what became of him. Um, there was times I, I thought to myself, well, I I just want to know where he's at, or how did he do this, or is he gone. So I I can't say I I have admiration. I I will say that I'm mildly impressed that he was able to avoid capture. And basically, from a modern technology perspective, he started out at a time with no technology. And he was able to successfully integrate his created life into a world that we know now of computers and technology that's used to track people all the time. Just just the mere act of getting a bank account or a driver's license, I think we take for granted. And he was able to navigate from a time period that has had much less restrictions you know, and much easier to accomplish getting uh, identification or other government documents to a time when now it's, it's very difficult. Um, so I think he, uh, he, he, was, he was at least bright, definitely a smart man, in my opinion. Uh, and he did. He was successful. And so I have the, I just won't say admiration, because, uh, but I, I sit back and go, well, he did it. I, I give him credit. He did it. But I don't know the negative impact on his life that he kept to himself. Obviously, he didn't share it with his family, um, but I'm sure this this had to have great uh, stress on him mentally, physically, emotionally, you name it. I, I'll never know those answers. I think that's something he, he will carry on with work. And now that he's passed, that's, it, that's his. How far, in your opinion, do you think a prison escapee um, from Nebraska might get today? I can't, I'll, I'll never say that someone can't escape a prison because the moment I do, someone's going to do it, right? <laughs> I think technically 
to do it, you'll I don't think anyone will be well, as, as successful with as he was, but I can't say it could never happen. But the safeguards in place are quite uh extensive. Um, but to to fully disappear, I just think it's incredibly difficult nowadays. Um he, I think he was of that generation where if you were gonna do it, that was the last time you could probably have that success. Because ultimately you you you're probably on camera. I can't say about you guys. You guys could be on camera all the time. But I think just a regular uh, citizen, member of the public, is on camera several times a day without knowing it. You know, banks, surveillance cameras, home cameras. You know, whoever thought that cameras would be in all the homes, or many homes at least, uh, everywhere we go, we're probably on cameras countless times a day and never know it. So the technology advances exist. I think it would just be so tough for an inmate. They might be able to escape, but to remain on the run, could be tough because you'd have to have the mindset that he had. Is you could never reach back uh, and touch that prior life because you don't know who, if you do that, who might talk. Or maybe the authorities are already in those locations thinking just in case uh, if someone currently escaped, they're making contact uh, to find out if you reach back at all. I think it would be tough to do it nowadays, uh, but I'll never say anything's impossible. Has this lit a fire? under you as far as seeing something through for so many years and being instrumental in the conclusion of it? Are you looking into anybody else now? No, and I've, I've been asked that a few times. Um, I, I think it's one that based on the ending and the amount of time put into it, but not only uh, the amount of time just by me alone, which is since, you know, 2004, at least the present time I've worked on it, but there's been countless other agencies the Omaha Police Department, the Nebraska State Patrol, the Nebraska Department of Correctional Services, you know, Intel services such as uh, MOCIC. So many people are involved um, along the way. I think I'm going to let this one rest. This is a, a good place for my interest in it. Um, it's not uh, my primary jurisdiction anymore. Um, I commend anyone who tries to investigate cold cases like this, and I hope the technology is out there to help them solve their cases. Uh, but to, to get back into another case, now, that'd be tough for me at this point, but I'm thankful to everyone along the way that helped, contributed, and I'm especially thankful uh, currently to the U.S. Marshal Service for taking this case uh, into the end zone, ultimately. It's such a great story to hear, and I'm sure you didn't expect it to conclude the way it did by learning about this individual and learning that he was a family man and his kids are even saying he was a good provider. He, right. you know, and then you have to like come to terms with, well, maybe he wasn't just all bad. Maybe it was just one moment and, you know, he ended up living the life he needed to live or he should have lived. Right. No, I, I don't disagree with you. I think that's uh, spot on. I, I do think he became uh, the parent that he, he wanted. Um, I, I'm, I was very happy to hear uh, reports of him being a good person. Uh, and good experiences for, uh, with his family. Uh, it's a good outcome. I mean, I I I, I was asked uh, a couple times of, hey, had you found him alive, you know, you would you'd have to arrange to have him brought back, and that's something obviously that the U.S. Marshal Service would would have handled. But just thinking of bringing back this man, if he was found, you know, just years earlier, and the disruption to that life again, not his life, because that's that's his his burden to carry, in my opinion, to be brought back to justice, but the impact on the family. And as I mentioned before, the, the my perspective on on this has changed quite a bit to, to remind myself that yes, that was the crime, and that he got his penalty. He didn't serve out his penalty, um, but this is an outcome I didn't expect to learn of who he became. But what I would want to have brought back in later years, not knowing what I know now, no, I think uh, the closure was the closure that was uh, meant to be, um, because I don't know if there would have been true justice value to bring him back um, if he was found alive. Who's going to play you in the movie? <laughs> well, I, I don't know about any movies, but it's definitely a fascinating story that's gotten some interest. And, and uh, there's just so many uh, so many moments in this that were just so interesting along the way. And I, I'm thankful for those friendships. And I look forward to what's uh, how the story's told. It's remarkable. Now you're saying, you know, you, you're you thankful for the friendships. You would have never made these friends had no. this guy not killed his parents at 16, gone to prison, and what, nine years later escaped successfully. That is uh, absolute fact. I would Isn't that not crazy? Have, it is. It's also weird to think that had he not killed his parents, escaped from prison, 
that I wouldn't be talking to his son. Right. His son wouldn't exist if those bad things didn't happen decades ago. So the things that had to line up for a lot of people's to just merely exist, let alone relationships that have stemmed from it, uh, are all remarkable to me. This guy deserves an award, let alone... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's definitely uh, a lot of people were involved and a lot of things wouldn't happen had these bad things not happened. But I think that's what we learn about life. Things happen. I'm I'm thankful for the outcome. And I'm I consider his uh his family, I, I consider them very close to me, and I would consider them friends, and we have had good conversations, and I'm thankful for the outcome that we got ultimately. And we have closure and there's resolution, and now I think that the process begins for his family to process the, the new information over time and go on. And, I, and, I, and I've said this to the family, you got to focus on your memories, your experiences with this person, and don't focus on his first life. Absolutely. Yeah. Wow. Well, Jeff, thank you so much for uh, joining us here today. We really appreciate your time and um, your uh, your energy for this story. I mean, what a cool uh, what a cool story to uh, to work on and to finally you know, see through all the way to the end. No, I appreciate both of you very much for, for your approach to this. And, and I've appreciated uh, how, how you went through it. And you're, you're, you're looking at all aspects of a case. And you, you're open to the fact that, you know, he ultimately did have a family. And they have their points of view. And you guys have been very kind. So I thank you both.